in North Liberty. Thank you to, to Nick and um, to whoever is you know, tuning in on Facebook and other libraries. So I've been going around um, <clears throat> doing what I'm, I've called a red state library tour and nobody's called it anything else. So I guess that's what it is. It's a red state library tour. And um, you know, I, this, this book, one of the, some people have said nice things about it, but maybe the nicest thing by far is that the American Library Association included it in their 2023 notable books list. There's only three memoirs on that list. And I know that libraries around the country uh, are very fond of their ALA. And, um, uh, you know, I just said, why don't we put this award to good use? Um, because libraries are getting slammed and, and they're getting slammed because of uh, the books by people, most, most of the books being banned, uh, clear majority are by writers of color, LGBTQ writers, um, and anything to do with the Holocaust, anything to do with um, women's empowerment um, are, are just the ones being targeted. It's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, frankly. It's a white supremacist agenda and I think what gets me frustrated about the, the folks who are like-minded, and most Americans are against book bans, what, what's frustrating though, is it's still being called a culture war. This ain't no culture war. Ain't no party, ain't no disco, ain't no culture war. So, um, uh, so what I, uh, I'll say a few things about libraries at, at the end, not much, but just a few things, because people here are smart. Um, but just to maybe get us talking. And, but before that, I thought I would do just a good old book talk, a reading, maybe a Q&A. And if you're interested, I could end with a poem, uh, you know, at the end of this whole thing. Um, so this body I wore chronicles a time where uh, trans people uh, didn't, a lot of us didn't know we were trans. You know, I call, I call this group the late transitioners. Early transitioners couldn't conceal from themselves or their family or anyone, you know, their transness. Late transitioners couldn't unearth it. And so, you know, the tagline for this book is, how, how did it go? How can you spend your life face to face with an essential fact about yourself and still not see it? And so I happen to have lived a life that was in sync with sort of the trans, the level of trans visibility in the US from invisibility to the so-called trans tipping point uh, in 2013, when the Vern Cox, you know, was on the cover of life looking fabulous. And they called it the trans tipping point. And the medium was the message because it was, I mean, there she was, if Time Magazine says it, it happens. That's how crazy that level of exposure was suddenly. Well, that's when I was transitioning. You know, Caitlyn Jenner and I are kind of the same timing. I don't think we're the same, but the timing was very similar. And suddenly I realized I had a front row seat for a lot of history. And in particular, there was a group, uh, uh, a cross-dressing subculture in New York City uh, in like the mid 1980s that I saw going into the 90s that um, I plunged into, um, not knowing why I was doing this, why I needed to do this. And everyone else didn't know either. Nobody could explain why they were cross-dressing. Nobody, not a single person could explain that. Um, and at the same time, I, was, I had a career as a school teacher at Stuyvesant High School as a New York City public school teacher, just sort of doing this and we were risking our jobs, our livelihoods, depending on who this person was, where they were coming from. And most of these people identified as straight males. And I would venture to say we're trans and didn't know it. And so I thought I would read a little bit from that because that's kind of the place where a lot of red state lawmakers want to send trans people back to when we couldn't see ourselves, when we couldn't know ourselves, um, we couldn't read about ourselves, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll read you something from the prologue. And uh, since it's the prologue, 
I don't need to say anything else. It's the pro it's page one. Stepping out, 1987. One hot summer day, crossing a street in Brooklyn, I thought, maybe it would be better if I were dead. The thought had never visited me before, and yet I knew why it was here. I'd run out of road. I want to stop a second. Is there a mic that I need or not? Okay, we're good. I'd run out of road. On the surface, my life may have appeared promising. I was 24, healthy, and had just begun a career as an English teacher at Stuyvesant High School. But inside, I felt desolate. After two years in New York City, I didn't have one close friend. My attempts at romantic relationships had all ended before we'd even had sex. My isolation made no sense to me. It felt like a punishment and a bad dream that didn't include the crime I was being punished for. I envied people I saw together, laughing on park benches, at sidewalk restaurant tables, playing tennis in Central Park, lined up outside the Beacon Theater. I overheard two people on the subway making plans to go to the beach, and it lacerated me. A childhood friend wrote to tell me her husband had suffered a collapsed lung and I e even envied her, fretting in a hospital waiting room with more purpose to her life than I could fathom. But here was something new, albeit morbid. Maybe it would be better if I were dead. And on the heels of that thought came another. If you're going to die, you might as well step out once as a woman. The two thoughts had hit me in the time it took to cross Adams Street a four-lane highway that led to the Brooklyn Bridge. I did an about face, recrossed those lanes, and headed to a women's shoe store off the Fulton Street Mall. I'd passed that store many times, noting a sign advertising wide sizes. We get men in here all the time, said a sales girl, mercifully. I selected a pair of cream-colored pumps. The sales girl brought me to a chair near the stock room away from the windows and handed me two nylon footies. My heart, which had been racing in fear, shifted into excitement. The pumps fit snugly. I looked down, amazed. The arch of my instep looked just like a woman's. I took a few steps and walked quite easily, even though I'd never walked in heels. Shaving my legs in the bathtub felt ecstatic and illicit. With each stroke of the blade, I feared the authorities would storm in and arrest me for a crime against nature. My calves and knees looked surreal in their hairlessness, while the startling amount of body hair swirling on top of the soapy bath water threatened to clog the drain. After getting dressed, I took down a heavy round mirror from the wall and propped it against a door frame to behold my whole body from a strange angle turning this way and that. I had on a long sleeved gold lame blouse and matching skirt to go with the cream pumps. I actually thought I looked great. I planned to go to the Eulage Spiegel Society, an S&M association whose gatherings on East 4th Street I'd seen advertised regularly in the back pages of the Village Voice. Cruelty didn't turn me on, but sissies were explicitly welcome there and no doubt fit into any number of role play scenarios. Those didn't interest me either, but if someone offered to lick my shoes, I'd figure out how to deal with it. When the car arrived, there was already a passenger in it, a woman also going to Manhattan. Where is he going? She said to the driver not one bit happy when I joined her in the back seat. I didn't say anything or look at her. If she called me a pervert, I wasn't sure I could honestly disagree. Being out in women's clothes was moment by moment the biggest turn on I'd ever experienced. The car pulled up to a curb in Lower Manhattan to drop off my disgusted fellow passenger. I glanced at her as she climbed out a frail lady in black. I was alone now, 
being driven through Manhattan at night, I thought of all the times I've gazed at women hailing cabs on the avenues of New York, ladies in dresses and coiffed hair, young women in aerobics tights with thick ponytails, businesswomen in sheer stockings and pumps, red nails on a door handle, a symphony of bend and swivel, shift and pivot, keeping legs together, settling like a bird in a nest, then safely shutting the door as they tell the driver their address. Witnessing this or any moment from a woman's day, smoothing a, shirt, smoothing a skirt, checking lipstick in a mirror could put me in a stupor. Whoever the particular woman was, she was likely having a day full of ordinary worries and distractions, though I couldn't shake the belief that all women were citizens of a better world, living superior lives moment by moment, simply because they were women. And now I was one of them, sort of, approximately, enough anyway, for people on the street to assume there was a female passenger in the back seat of a car rolling by in the night. I looked down at my hairless legs, glowing and dimming with each passing street light. I rested a hand on my thigh, which sent shudders of pleasure through me. I recrossed my legs, felt flesh rubbing flesh through nylon, and shut my eyes in ecstasy. We pulled up to the curb on East 4th Street. I paid the driver, thanked him in a falsetto British accent, and stepped out into the night. Walking to the door of the Eulenspiegel Society, I was too consumed with every sensation and footfall and with all that awaited me to register something every bit as momentous. I might have just saved my own life. So that's the prologue, and that's how this thing um, gets started. And uh, so I do plunge into this world, and within six months, I'd seen a lot uh, in, in New York City. There's a scene, there's a, there's a brief scene where I go to the library to research, you know, what the hell's going on with me. And in the what the hell is going on with me section, there's not a lot about me. There was all this science and journals and graphs and charts. And, you know, there's a Dr. Harry Benjamin who's famous for studying trans people, women in particular. And uh, it was so naive and primitive, it didn't tell me anything. But I had, the, I had New York City, so I went and did the real research. And I was um, being a school teacher and I was dressing later on in 1987. So this chapter is called The Fabric Factory. I'll read, I'll read most of it. It's a short chapter and then, then a little addendum uh, afterwards. And The Fabric Factory was the name of um, the most eclectic, best tranny bar, quote unquote, in New York. And I use the language uh, that fits the times, language that today would, would be horrible. But it's the only words we had. And I thought it was really important to show the reality at the time. So you're going to hear all kinds of, you know, horrible words, <laughs> frankly. Um, so maybe that's a content warning. <clears throat> the Fabric Factory, 1987. The Fabric Factory bar on West 41st Street has a dressing room in the basement for men who arrive in trousers and polo shirts carrying duffel bags and appear an hour later at the top of the stairs in gowns or skirt suits teetering in high heels like newborn cults. Though most arrive already dressed as women, they come from as far as Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. They have shaved and prepped themselves all afternoon, appropriated clothes from their wives' closets, snuck out to their cars at dusk, braved the stairs of highway toll takers, risked getting pulled over by troopers. By midnight, they have five o'clock shadows. I take the subway from Brooklyn. I'm safe on mass transit, I tell myself, as long as I go all out, like an actor who fully commits. Even if the material is flawed, people respect the effort. Some writers look at me and look away. And those who don't notice me at all, well, that's even better. 
I dress like an ordinary woman coming from work. Most cross-dressers overdo it in some way, a crazy wig or garish makeup, a too tight outfit or stiletto slingbacks they can't manage. Not that I don't respect whatever turns them on, I just happen to get turned on by blending. I'd like with my first step inside the fabric factory to be seen as a woman who entered the wrong bar. There's a contingent of Filipino pre-ops who hang out near the front window. They wear little slinky dresses and speak to each other in rapid fire Tagalog while tossing their hair and checking themselves in compact mirrors. There's a small lineup of chasers who lean against the opposite wall, deciding sometimes for hours which girl they will approach. There are TVs from a suburban New Jersey support group who drink together in a small pack and seem like they could be tailgating at giant stadium. Their motto, by the way, is, I later found out, no tranny left behind. There's Vicky from Long Beach who supports an aging mother and a kid in college by working a security job. She wears a see-through see tops and mini skirts over bare legs and speaks in a saccharine falsetto that sounds like someone driving a nail through a parrot. There's Adele, a married TV who is smart and stable and 10 years my senior. She's neither ugly nor stunning, whereas designer labels is quite ladylike and fairly passable. I like talking to Adele. Sometimes she brings her wife, Mara, who is plump with a pretty face and is often the only GG, genetic girl, in the bar. She and Mara have no children and use an entire bedroom of their house as a closet. I picture aisles of stylish clothes, like a small store the two of them share. Stephanie from Long Island wears fake dagger-like nails, a long black wig, heavy makeup, and super short skirts, but cancels these efforts by walking and talking like a building contractor in stilettos, which she is. She shows up maybe once a month, drinks a lot, and discusses her truck. We envy her size seven and a half feet. Kayla, young, tall, and pretty, visits from Tennessee a few times a year. She is on a mission to compete in drag beauty pageants and is on hormones to grow breasts to help the cause. After she wins one, she swears she'll stop the hormones. She's unbuttoned her blouse just low enough to display smooth chest flesh and the budding of some cleavage, a sight that fills me with shock and envy. In Tennessee, Kayla lives as a man named Ken who binds his breasts in ace bandages to patrol center field for the company's softball team. Stan, a Vietnam vet, wears Mary Jane flats, a black page boy wig, a shapeless cotton frock, and has no girl name. The first time I saw him, he was handcuffed to a young black woman who hardly spoke. I couldn't quite figure out the dynamic. There are drag queens who drop by after their midnight shows at Hell's Kitchen bars, gay boys tall as NBA forwards who wear hip pads and butt pads and have racks you could fold laundry on. They talk exclusively to one another as if they are royalty. If we're lucky, we may get a visit from International Crisis, who is royalty, Salvador Dali's one-time transsexual muse, often seen on page six of the New York Post and rumored to be dating some Hollywood actor. Crisis trails her entourage of taciturn queers, her red cheeks puffed around a small chiseled nose, her cleavage carved deep from male order progesterone that will overtake her liver in two years time. We come to the fabric factory like animals to water. Whether we drink or not, whether we mingle or dance or sit alone in a corner just enjoying the feeling of being out in our clothes, we are nourished every time we hear the pronoun she and realize it's us, there's a shock and shiver of life. We tell one another 
how we got through our week, the hiding, the purging, the fear, the thrill. Someone's wife was in tears again, threatening to leave. Someone was spotted by a cop while getting dressed behind bushes in a vacant lot, though the cop mercifully left her alone. We share our confusion. How can we love sports and car engines and also love this? How can we love women and also this? I consider myself a lesbian, says a huge cross-dresser in a yellow prom dress. We talk about how we handle our families, those who have families, and church, those who attend. We trade advice on how to create cleavage, cover beard shadow, fill bras, tuck our genitals, what to tell our coworkers who ask about our long nails. I play guitar, our long hair, I'm in a band, our shaved legs. I'm a cyclist or a swimmer, our tweezed eyebrows. I don't know what you're talking about. We tell each other where we shop. Um, we report on places we can go. Someone found a midtown hotel bar that doesn't mind our presence. Someone found a diner in Queens. There's the Pyramid Club in the East Village, a loud, a big loud punk, punk goth queer grungy den of who the fuck cares. Sally's Hideaway, a couple blocks north and across from the New York Times building, has drag shows, drugs, and prostitutes, or you could stick by the bar and just smoke and drink. Club Edelweiss is too hardcore for most of us, though there are always some stunning transsexuals there. Tranny chasers, that's actually the name of the place. Below ground on 7th Avenue is more tame. In the months since stepping out for the first time, I have been to nearly all these places, though there is nothing quite like the fabric factory, eclectic, warm, and welcoming. Like your first little league field, it is both a home and a destination. A man can wander aimlessly in a city at night, but a lady needs a destination. During the week, garment district executives come here to drink their lunches, but every Saturday, the fabric factory is ours, and the disco ball in the middle of the ceiling shines its ever receding facets on the faces people on the faces of people we are 20 years away from having any respectable words for so that's a little bit from a lot i guess from that chapter and let me just go to one passage of a few paragraphs um, to talk a little bit about my internal life at this point you know what what was i thinking you know that part of of uh of memoir and then, um, and then we'll, we'll talk maybe a little bit about libraries or have a q and A. I I had goals of marriage and family. I had no idea how to pursue a life that included female love and companionship, but I assumed it started with putting an end to dressing and growing out my body hair. Otherwise, how could I explain shaved or stubbly legs to a date? Dressing made it hard to date and have a sex life. At times, I suspected that was its function, to keep me far from sex and intimacy. When I heard other cross-dressers refer to themselves in the third person as my girlfriend, it sounded silly and a little creepy, yet dressing was as time-consuming and as costly as dating. The shopping, the shaving, the beard cover, the makeup, the outfit, no, the other outfit, the going out. Sometimes in my optimism, I told myself that dressing was just a temporary thing, an hors d'oeuvre to tide me over while I waited for the feast of life to begin. Though I had no idea what exactly that feast would consist of, nor when it would be served. These two views of dressing, healthy versus destructive, were at war inside most of the cross-dressers I knew. We commiserated, and we were kind to one another, but I'd never call what we had community, maybe because we didn't trust what drew us together. None of us understood where cross-dressing came from. All too often, 
It felt like a perversion and a curse. And the person you commiserated with might disappear for months, or you might. The gay community, which was being decimated by AIDS, was still a community. The pink and blue silence equals death posters we pasted all over New York City told them it was vital to come out. There were nightclubs and businesses, newspapers, districts of cities and entire towns on Fire Island and Cape Cod devoted to their lifestyle. Whereas cross-dressers had just a few bars catering to us one night a week, bars that blinked in and out of existence. The fabric factory wouldn't make it into the 1990s. There was no daytime life for us, and many of us hibernated during summer months when makeup and beard cover would melt off our faces and wigs and shapewear would cook us. Most of us preferred to keep this pocket of ourselves sealed off from other pockets. We talked to each other about our lives but there was no thought of ever meeting someone's friends or families and little chance of us getting together outside of our nocturnal haunts. People were reluctant to give out phone numbers for fear of who might pick up or hear a message on an answering machine. This was before cell phones and texting, which no doubt would have helped us connect. In place of community, we settled for an, evening, an evening's camaraderie. So thank you for listening. And there's a few passages from just the opening section of this body I wore. Thank you. Um, so, um, and again, you know, I think perhaps most of this book is, is historical, but it's, you know, what I had a front row seat for. And we seldom think we have a front row seat for history, although we get the sense now we do. I asked an old uh, teacher, my first writing teacher, who's now 90, um, still in touch with her. And I said, how does this compare to 1968? She said, oh no, this is far more dramatic. This is more extreme, this is worse. Um, you know, 1968, the so-called crack in time. Um, this is quite a crack in time. But, you know, I now know that, you know, looking back after the so-called trans tipping point, it seems bizarre, you know, that we had this, this primitive language, these paltry spaces, everything was quite seedy. People were limited, you know, people who were full-time were just limited to, you know, careers on the side stream, you know, so-called street queens, uh, prostitutes, people mixed in with uh, homosexual culture or, or others you know, like me and people I knew who were just trying somehow to live these dual lives. You know, I was a teacher and this person was a corporate person, that person was a, a guard. And, you know, we were everywhere, fully trans, but not knowing it. Um, can I say a few words about libraries? Um, you know, we have a librarian here. You guys are hip to all kinds of things, you know, in, in Iowa, perhaps, and I'm not. But uh, I wanted to show a little bit of history um, in light of you know, what's happening now in, in libraries. I think this might wake up if I do this. Here's this footage that's fairly well known. And, and again, this might be nothing new to people. And by the way, can people see this also on this camera that goes everywhere? <laughs> okay, great. Um, and let me just play a few versions of it because we, we see these clips of it. So this is from, um, what is this from? What's the source of this? The, no, this is from the Holocaust Museum. Um, so a little bit about the Nazi, the Nazi book burnings. And I think we have sound on Two this. German students decided to organize a nationwide book burning program to eliminate foreign influence, the purified German culture as they saw it. So you have committees of students meeting with professors together, deciding what categories of books in these university libraries would count as un-German. They didn't see themselves as suppressing culture, they saw themselves as advancing very German culture. So un-German, you know, not very different from un-American. So you see the footage there, 
That is, well, look at this footage now. We have another tape. Um, kind of at any link you go to, anything the teacher might have taught you in history. Um, here's another, here's some more footage. This is from the Holocaust Encyclopedia. Fantastic website, by the way. Um, and here's another book burning. In Berlin, the other one. So if we have a slow connection. Notice any similarity between the book burnings? So it's the same footage. We only have footage of one book burning. Apparently, uh, the, the Nazi officers forgot their cell phones. I have checked my information with a librarian, but I think that was the case. We only have, you know, we didn't have cameras everywhere. And so it's the same book burning. This took place on May 10th in uh, the square outside the Opera House um, in Berlin. And uh, if this continues, let's see what we have. You'll see the culture minister, Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels, show up the book burning. No dice. And we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see if it catches. Them. So um, they were burning books in a coordinated way that night at 34 places in Germany. But this is the only footage we have. Now, I, th I think it's pretty common knowledge that the focus was on Jewish intellectuals, Jewish authors. Uh, there were also American authors, uh, such as Hemingway, Helen Keller, you know, because the Aryan race was about, you know, some perfect ideal body. Here's somebody with an unstandard body. Um, and, and there were others as well, other intellectuals who were, who were free thinkers. But not, not this fire. This fire is exclusively 20,000 volumes from a library a few blocks away. And that library uh, was inside a gender clinic. It was Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute of Sexology, where they were giving trans care. And it was that library. Those are the books little over 20,000 books. These were books on intersex people, homosexual people, uh, scientific books on the best of what they knew about hormone replacement therapy. There is nothing new here. There's nothing new about trans people. We know that by now, but this was very advanced, you know, and they went right in there. Um, there were also books just on people's testimonials, people's experiences, the kinds of books that people need to see themselves on the outside so they can kind of identify what's going on inside. A trove. Those were the books in the footage, and very few people know that. We've got school children kind of watching this, and those are the books. Um, so, you know, you say white supremacy, and it sounds like, you know, black, white, and, and, and so forth. But it's actually, you know, white supremacy is just anyone with a non-standard body or a body that doesn't conform, you know, to basically white males, you know, straight, white, heterosexual males. Straight, white, heterosexual females would be relatively safe, but what's common to every single fascist regime is just flagrant misogyny. So there's that. You know, so white supremacy covers a lot of categories. And there's something else, if I can maybe zoom out to this. So, sorry about the, um, the connection not being better, um, but it's, this, it's mostly what I want you to see, that it's, it's the same damn fire. Um, but uh, there, there's one phrase uh, that, that's really important, and that's, um, I think anyway, that's this phrase, synchronizing culture with Nazi ideology. That's what's going on. They're, they're not hoping to um, win any arguments about why the master race and the Aryan race is the Aryan race. And that's not, that's not what they're trying to do. They're using terror. They're using conformity. Um, and they're synchronizing. You know, you get rid of every book that's not this ideology and you start to eliminate 
any counter narrative, you know, to Hitler. And Hitler had just come into power on January 31st, just about three months before this took place. And the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll note about this is, did you, did you notice that it wasn't the government organizing this? These were groups of citizens, students. But no sooner do they start the fire than the culture minister Goebbels shows up. So they were handshaking with the government. But it was important for, for them to, to have this scene as this, you know, the student group and the student uprisings. And what you had was the leaders knew exactly what they were doing, that they were synchronizing the culture, that this was a, a kind of a, a, a conquering of, of the mindset, a gaslighting. Um, the people in the square who were cheering this, they didn't know they were getting gaslit. And the people themselves who were the subjects of the book burnings, they were just being terrorized. That's another kind of synchronizing. You know, they knew they weren't safe. Good, that works for the dominant um, group. That's a synchronizing as well. They flee, they become refugees. Great, more beer for us. They love that. Now, um, we now have trans refugees all over the United States. We now, have, we now have a populace who's convinced that this is a group that's dangerous. And we now, have, we now have leaders who know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to synchronize libraries with the dominant ideology. That's what it is. I mean, when you ban a book about Frida Kahlo, when you ban a book about Aretha Franklin, you know, what's that? You know, it sends the message that if you're black, if you're a certain kind of woman, you know, banning books by Roberto Clemente, books about Roberto Clemente. Um, some of these people are on postage stamps. You know, this is not CRT. Um, you're sending a message that if you're this kind of person with this kind of body, a gay body, a queer body, a trans body, a female body, a body of color, um, we get to ban your book. Even if it doesn't work, we get to challenge your book. Why? Because you're wrong. Why are you wrong? Because of your body. And if we can terrify these people, and if we can convince others that there's a ranking system going on, um, it's fine. It works. Even if the ban doesn't succeed, you still shoot the poison you know, into a community. So um, I don't know if you all know this, but there's not just book banning going on in Spotsylvania County, um, in Virginia, two years ago, they proposed a book banning. Here's the Facebook page for it, and rather a book burning. And um, prior to this page being, uh, what, what led to this page, uh, you know, being composed by these folks uh, was two people on the school board in Spotsylvania Public Schools saying, we got to burn these books. And the guy who said, there's two people and, and this footage of it, I could have shown you that too, but one of the people talking said, first, we got to investigate the authors. Yeah, good luck investigating Tony Morrison. There were 14 books, you're going to investigate Tony Morrison. You know, his dad, but, you know, go ahead and investigate her even when she's alive. What we're we going to get, we're going to find, you know, she's one of the great Americans, Nobel Prize winning author. Um, and then, you know, other citizens kind of got the cue. And there's the page. Start having your children check out library books from their school now. I love the spelling of there, so we know the literacy level of these folks. You do not want, once you do not want in our schools at the school board meeting, we will have a fire pit in the parking lot and we'll burn every last one of them you bring. At the end of the year, you will have to pay for them. <clears throat> but this year, no one will be able to check them out. Feel free to bring marshmallows and a stick. So I stopped in to a couple of libraries when my Red State Library tour uh, hit Virginia. And I 
you know, here it is on the road. Let's just let's just pay him a visit. And I'm talking to the good librarians you know, in the area. One of whom was a school librarian when that school board meeting happened. And now she's transferred to being a public librarian. So just a couple points about Moms for Liberty and these other groups. I don't know if you know this, over 70% of them were founded since the pandemic. This is not, you know, ordinary people protesting a book. You know, like the music man, you know, Chaucer, Ravelades, Balzac, you know, and, you know, this dirty stuff. There's always a few prudes in a community and that's fine. Librarians know that this is garden variety protest. It's great, it's healthy, it's fine, let's do that. This is different. You know, this is a front group. And we know that mothers, moms for liberty, not North Liberty, moms for liberty doesn't give a damn about safety and protecting children. And the way we know that is because they don't say a single word about school massacres. They don't spare a single word about kids getting gunned down in schools. They don't give a damn about protecting children. We also know that they don't care one bit about what's being called variously by different states, um, explicit sex, you know, explicit sexuality and so forth. And, and that, you know, they're minors having access to it. And do you know how we know that? Anybody know how we know for sure that they don't care about that one bit? Want to take a guess? Who's got a cell phone? What happens when you Google live sex in your cell phone? I mean, you really need to go to a library to rebel? They don't say a word about cell phones, which their kids walk around with, or Google, computers, the internet. They don't give a damn about any of this legislation and the wording of it. It's as plain as day. Book banning is not a culture war. This is about synchronizing um, red states, a voter, uh, you know, an electorate with white supremacy. So it's an opinion, but this is why I say this opinion. And this is why I wrote that in that op-ed in the Tampa Bay Times. And they actually kept my headline. Uh, the headline was, book banning isn't a culture war any more than crossbird. They never keep your headlines. You said an op-ed, they always put their own headline on, but you know, they kept it. Uh, so that's what I had. And you know, maybe we can just talk to each other a little bit. Are, are they capable of asking questions on Facebook and uh, writing in uh, the live stream as well, Nick? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I've, I've yapped enough. What's coming up for people? We can talk about um, the book and some of this history that I saw, or, or you know, perhaps about libraries. You could tell me what you see. Yes. Hmm. So we have several, but I'm going to set aside most of them to allow other people to ask questions. Uh, the opening passage was very powerful to me because we know how trans individuals deal with uh, depression and suicide. Sure. Right. And so the illusion of you walking towards Brooklyn Bridge, which we know people jump off of. Sure. Right? Yep. And then coming around to that last moment, turning around from that despair, right? Or that decision. Yeah. Right. And saying, at least live life once a woman. Right. right. I think it's an amazingly powerful message to provide. And so I thank you for, for writing that. Because uh, that really touched me. You taught at Stuyvesant? Yeah, I did, 14 years. It's a bastion of the intellectual students and- They're geniuses. Yeah, you have yeah, to test must... it in a way that is unbelievable. They're right? also beautiful. I yeah. love these kids. They have a great debate team, by the way. Uh, they were, they were champions many years. Yeah. Julie Scheinman was their coach. Yes, I know Julie very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But you said you 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 had fear there. Where is that at Stuyvesant? You feared for your job. Well, we all did. I mean, there was nothing protecting us. And I mean, you know, there's a time you could be fired if it was found out you were gay. Yeah, I mean, we had, a, we had a teacher who was dying of AIDS, would not say it. And it was plain as day in front of us all. We love this man. I'll say his name. It was Matt Litwin because he was beloved. The late Matt, late great Matt Litwin. And he taught a class in psychopharmacology that was just hopping. I mean, really good teacher. And these are, you know, lots of future doctors took Matt Lipton's class. And he couldn't say, I mean, a, a guy who taught, you know, medical studies couldn't say it. I mean, it was just, it was just the time. A lot of people were risking their jobs. People were risking their status in churches. People were risking their marriages. You know, people getting kicked out of houses and so forth. I was going to talk to you a little bit about and ask you some more questions about your kinship communities. But this this last description you had about book banning, I think, alludes to some of the other stuff you wrote about where the citizen vigilante. Right. Right. Uh, we know that that was promoted in Texas by the governor. We know in Nebraska, for instance, the young teen that just was sentenced to jail time uh, for taking abortion pills sure. was ratted out by a peer who happened to be there when she took the pill. Sure. Right. And now we have this Fredericksburg. Right. What, what strategies do you see being deployed uh, about the citizen? Vigilante. Okay. And yeah. what, what are some suggested uh, survival strategies okay. as a trans right woman that you that you yourself right engage in or suggest yeah. to others? Okay, that's great. So there's a couple of good things here. If I can just I'll take the last one first. So there's levels. I think I mentioned these three, these three layers of synchronizing the culture. Um, you know, with uh, a fascist ideology. Um, and I think it's absolutely going on. Um, you have the layers of the leaders, you have the layers of folks who are getting gaslit, you know, sort of the enthralled Trump base, the MAGA base. Um, Trump doesn't believe the things he says, but he knows the base does. It's an absolute cult situation. And then the third layer are the, the targets who are just ter terrified terrorized, you know. Um, in, in terms of, of the action though, of, of doing this, there's, um, you know, you take a group like Moms for Liberty, they're funded by dark money. They have inroads into state houses, the Florida State House in particular. They meet with DeSantis to agree on language that's so vague that the librarians of Florida are, are, are scared to death. And so they wind up, you know, preemptively removing books from their shelves. Um, so on the one hand, they kind of go up, if you could say, to the legislative uh, net coordination. But on the other hand, it also reaches down and out to what's known as stochastic terrorism. You know, you send a dog whistle message and people who are not necessarily, you know, coming to your conventions, although the Proud Boys are now coming to the Moms for Liberty, scene, they were speaking there. But the, the other folks who just, you know, some crazed vigilante, some book vigilante, some, you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, they see that. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the ALA wrote to Christopher Ray, head of the FBI, when there was a particular glut of threats of violence, bomb threats, shooting threats, five libraries in five states within a week, and they just wrote a letter saying, you know, what are you doing? Can, can you please look into this? Can you please protect us from violence? That's, just, that's the stochastic terrorism. That's, you know, seeding the ground so that someone shows up when I come to a library in a concealed carry state and this might happen and they have plausible deniability. So it's those three layers, I think, you know, they go up and then they go, they go down you know, in that way. 
you know, in terms of what to do, I mean, I'm no cultural leader. Uh, I don't have any movement, but I just, you know, we have fear, fight, or flight. You know, these, they're all survival responses, you know, to traumatic situations. And, you know, I think people do what they need to do. I'm not here to criticize somebody who fears, uh, somebody who flees. I tend to fight. And I get really concerned when people call off pride marches, when librarians take down pride displays. I understand it. But can you picture Martin Luther King canceling a march? Never happened. You know, and I think he knew that if he ever did, it would just simply enable greater violence. As bad it, as bad as it was, the police dogs, the fire hoses, the rubber bullets were worse. You know, so um, I just think it becomes more dangerous if if we don't act. But but again, you know, I have friends who are parents of a trans kid. They moved their kid out of Texas. Another friend moved her kid out of Tallahassee. Um, you know, and of course they did. I thought that was a powerful statement when you said trans refugees, because I do think we do have refugees in the United States where people are moving to states that are magnets that are starting to draw a much more inclusive diverse Right, and, and you know, Texas is kind of happy about that. Um, because again, you know, they become even more radicalized. Uh, it becomes part of your appeasement. You know, it's, it's no longer a state trending purple, you know, because of all that. And, you know, who's ever going to blame a Jewish refugee for leaving Germany? You know, by the way, anybody, anybody know the percentage of uh, Germans who were German Jews, percent of Jewish people in Germany at the time of Hitler's rise, 1933? Anyone know the percentage? Jewish people in Germany. You want to take a guess? 0.75%. You could take a minority that microscopic and stoke up, you know, those book burnings all over Germany. Militarize an entire populate. And in a way, it makes sense because there's no way you'd get a counter message out when your minority is that small. We actually hear that argument, I think, sometimes in the anti trans legislation where it's like, it's just a small number of people anyway. It's 0.75. It's the same percentage. Now, it skews young because young people kind of grew up after the trans tipping point, so they have more of a chance of coming out young. There's less shame, you know, in the last several years. Um, and also, a lot of the people in this book never made it out of the 20th century, so the numbers are going to skew young. It's going to look more like 1.4%. But overall, 0.75%. This is the Williams Institute, which is the most authoritative for this. They're out of UCLA. Um, you know, and, and so you wonder, well, I don't wonder at all, uh, you know, looking at uh, the German situation from 1930s, um, militarizing a whole mess of folks, activating them. We've got Americans who plan their day around paranoia and hatred of trans people, not even maybe knowing any of them in their lives. So that's the other strategy I would say, maybe we get some other questions too, if, if, if people are asking them. The other strategy I would say is, is kind of the Harvey Milk strategy. Come out if you possibly can. Come out. We've got to raise the number of uh, out trans people in communities everywhere because they have families, families who love them. Uh, and that will raise the number of trans allies. When Harvey Milk said this, he was seen as almost reactionary. That's what we have to do. He was so wise. Because you take that forward a decade and a half, you have Dick Cheney coming out in favor of gay marriage because he's got a gay daughter. Who would have think, who would have thunk it? You know, and that's radical when that happens. You know, there are Republican families with, with trans relatives that they love, you know, and it forces them in their private life to, to maybe make a different choice. 
more of us come out, then we'll never be as high in number as the gay community. But, but if we get to a point where there are more trans allies than trans people, that's what happened with PFLAG. And PFLAG was the turning point in many ways of, uh, of the gay movement. When the parents, friends, they called it parents and friends because they didn't want somebody joining just uh, P, F, well, they didn't want P, H, well, whatever the initials are, they didn't want just a parent to be outing their kid as gay. So it was parents and friends of, you know, the rest of the, the, rest of the uh, letters and lesbians and gays, um, but it was parents, you know, um, led by Gene, um, to Gene Manfield, Gene Manford, uh, who was a hero. So, so we need that, that level of, I think, allyship of people coming out if they can, where they can, um, and, you know, do, do what, what worked for the gay community. The gay community, the black community, civil rights, fantastic role models for us. Thank God for, you know, those movements to be able to look at what they did and the wisdom of what they knew. Anything, any, any other, oh, oh, and the, the stuff about the opening, just, just briefly, um, that has since been called a death gift. And what I was writing about privately, even before I had heard that term, about, you know, it took wanting to die to finally make me consider, you know, coming out in one way or another. I've heard that a lot now since that. And, and I've heard that, that term being used by actually a trans man in an interview. He said, you know, transitioning was my death gift to myself. You know, and it really flies in the face of a lot of this disinformation about, oh, well, kids are gonna experiment. It's just an experiment, really. It's a death gift. You know, there is, there, we have yet to see, you know, this being a mere experiment. It could be um, a questioning. It could be a phase, of course, find out, you know, wait to see. Um, but it's not, it's not, nobody is influenced. And, you know, death isn't contagious in this way. Um, we're actually very isolated people. You know, but that, that's, that's what I've since learned about that moment, that it was very common to a lot of, a lot of people. That's what it took for us. That's how much resistance there was you know, to do this. Um, anyone here interested in discussing anything? Anything coming up for people? What do you think about, you talked a little bit about this new generation that's coming, I mean, I feel that this generation, the next generation, the ones who are going to vote now or yes. next year, yeah. are going to be the start of saving, <laughs> saving us. I keep hoping. Yeah. My optimism is there. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the, the strategy of getting them out of the states. And maybe the allies will be there too, is, is my hope. I mean, yeah. I think we'll see more of it as these kids come up. Yeah, I think what happened with. Uh, the vote in Kansas, the referendum on abortion, scared the crap out of the Republican Party. And they learned that now that they didn't have Roe versus Wade to fight against, you know, GOTV, get out the vote, they, it's harder to get out the vote. Another reason why they go toward a new, you know, fear tactic, trans kids. Um, uh, it's going to be a war you know, in that sense. I mean, they know that making kids, quote, wait to decide, they know that that's gonna result in a lot of death and a lot of refugees leaving. They know that. You know, the bathroom bills didn't work a few years ago. So they went, they went to school and they studied us. And they know that we have seven times the suicide rate as the general public. And, um, this dysphoria is never quite defined in any way that, that's satisfactory that I've heard, but I've recently come to the conclusion that the heart of dysphoria is not having had a childhood in your gender, which is something everyone, both trans and not trans, can think about. You know, 
what would it have been like to have no memory of a childhood in your gender? Who are you now? It's a little bit like Alzheimer's. And who are you when you go through your next life crisis without that foundation? You know, and then, and, and again, 100% of us, trans or not trans, can think about this. What would it be like to go through puberty in the wrong gender? What would it be like to wake up with a chest full of hair? What would you do? You know, and then to have, it, have that modification be illegal. Anyone could relate to that. Um, I mean, it's terrifying. And up until recently, every trans person I knew, well, not a single one had gone through, has a memory of a childhood in their gender. And now that we have kids who have a chance you know, to have that, there's a beautiful book out called A Girlhood, written by an award-winning author who has to write it under a pseudonym. And it's a love letter to her trans daughter about preserving her childhood. And she started out in a Southern state, now had to leave. Um, but it, it's exactly about this, giving someone, you know, the memory, she likened it to a library of a childhood in their gender. So that you have something. There's only one other group I've heard of with an exponentially higher suicide rate than the general public. Anybody know what, what group that is? People who had closed adoptions. Adopted people have four times the suicide rate of the general public. This is, I'm starting to connect a few of these things. I mean, it's hard being a lot of kinds of people. It's hard being a woman, it's hard being black, it's hard being gay, it's hard. But why, why this crazy, you know, increase uh, with these two groups, you know, in suicidality? And with people in closed adoptions, there was an essential element of their identity was absent during this important developmental phase. So, and the same with trans kids. It's actually not their bodies. It's not having their own identity to grow up in. It's more that, you know, and that's the thing that's being, you know, removed. So, um, you know, that's how I see the battle lines. Well, and now we're gonna see them. I mean, this new, these states in the South, specifically, I could see Iowa falling right in because obviously we're, I mean, our governor is also very much aligned with the, the Monster Liberty. Uh, yeah. Openly aligned. And I could see this happening here, but the states who are now these attorney generals seeking to follow women and trans. And yeah. The, the, anyone seeking gender for me care. Right. Right, yeah. exactly. It's they're terrifying. doing. It's terrifying. They're, they're it's trying to. Terrifying. They're trying to pair one with the other, you know, and, and it's happening a lot. They're trying to synchronize, um, you know, what could happen, um, you know, with um, people getting abortion rights in one way or another, with uh, trans kids, you know, getting rights as well. And you, you you see it a lot. The attorney general of Tennessee went after the medical records of trans people. Well, and now they want to follow them in other states. And they're following them to other states, and now they're doing the same thing with women getting abortions in other states. They're wanting to piggyback. And again, they know what they're doing. It's about votes. It's about power. And it's also about, you know, kind of synchronizing people, whether it's in terror or beliefs, saying that, yeah, this is the way, this is God's way, this is this way, this is the American way, you know. I mean, let anyone call me an American. I was born on the 4th of July. I've got relatives in four places in Europe, so I'm a mutt. That's pretty American. And I have a degree in American studies. Pretty American. Um, you know, but I'm less American, you know, because of, you know, I don't have the standard body type. Yeah, it, it, it's scary, but yeah, I, I agree with you. The, I mean, the, you know, voter registration is everything. I mean, that's part of the voter suppression laws is not allowing anyone to register more than X number of people. Why? For no reason why. It's just that you don't want 
100 people voting. Uh, Texas was doing this. If you if you register more than 100 people, you can't. You know, and there's all of these strictures. I mean, when you have 40 percent of an electorate that doesn't vote, you know, you could outvote the corruption. You know, to me, that's the salient thing about the national. Like, can you outvote the corruption? You know, and it's it's a race. You know, it doesn't help when the quote liberal, the news media, the neutral news media, you know, the, the news media that just wants to make a profit, which is the fly in the ointment of the fourth estate, is profit. It doesn't help when they call it a culture. You know, that's like calling you know Jim Crow a culture. It's not, it's civil rights. So yeah, we're in a moment. Say the least. How and many places are you speaking in Ireland? In Iowa, I'm not going to say too much, you know, publicly. Sure. No, just how many? I just um, the next these five days, I'll be in six libraries. I was at two more last week, and Prairie Lights, and you know, wherever. Some libraries send me to local bookstores, so I'll be on Book TV on C-SPAN. They they film me at a bookstore in uh, in Missouri, in Columbia, Missouri, but it was the librarians that go there. I take all my cues from librarians. One town here, the librarian wanted to send me to the college, but she'll get the people, but the college has security. You know, so however we do this is okay, you know, with me. We appreciate you. Thank you, I appreciate, appreciate you coming by. Is there, is there anyone on the live feed? There's, I I was worried about like walking in front of the I camera. Oh, I don't. We're all we're all informal here. I don't see any questions. Okay. Can I ask another one? That'd be all right. Yeah, of course. Because allyship is something that uh, as, as a person that wants to be an ally. Yes. Uh, is important because then there's resistance to allyship. Uh, we see this in Afro pessimism. We see this in a number of trans writings, right? Where it's uh, we should just learn survival strategies, sit back and listen. Right? And that's one. Uh, in your discussion, you actually talked a little bit about the alienation or isolation of uh, trans persons during the time of, uh, of your writing, when you talked about cross-dressers, very few location, even the fabric factory, you know, did make it there. We also grew up thinking we were the only ones in our town who, who was like this. So there were very little. We talked about the most isolated people on the planet. Yes. I can't think of any group more isolated than individual, you know, trans and trans people. The people uh, who are poo pooing allyship are idiots. They don't know history. They don't know. They don't know what happened with Pete Black. Um, and uh, and Stonewall. Well, the thing with allies and allies don't know this. A lot of allies feel helpless. And feel that say, well, what can I possibly do? I, I'm going to tell you what you can do. When you speak up, it's exponentially more impactful than when I speak up for myself. When somebody corrects misgendering, you know, who, who's uh, who's not trans, uh, you know, they're not doing it out of self-interest. You know, they're doing it because they're sending a message of what is right from somebody who they can see you know, a fellow cisgender person, it is exponentially more powerful. I wrote this op-ed for the Tampa Bay Times. It'd be far more powerful if I were an ally and not trans. You know, think about the amount of passion that comes through that. You know, and now you're hearing from people who are, quote, like you, and you may be losing this battle, and you may be on the wrong side of history, all of that messaging is sent far more powerfully by the ally than by the trans person who's obviously self-interested. I'm obviously self-interested. You know, if other authors um, copied me and went on a red state library tour, 
it could be even more powerful than a trans author, you know, doing it because there's a lot to say. I know the academy did start uh, trans dedicated trans studies journals until 2010. It's 2010. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have a dedicated journal uh, in communication studies and in, in the academy period. Well, med schools don't have trans medicine. Right. There's a couple, but you know, very much still, so, still outliers. It's really, you know, being an aspect of the academy, the role that I play in different places, and I try to do what I can to kind of promote policies and actions within departments and units, right? To promote allyship yeah. across the board for diversity. So I'm just looking for additional strategies. So thank you. Yeah, I think I think you know, kinship letting letting important. allies know how powerful they could be. Um, you know, the mission is true. I think again, a lot of times people feel helpless. It's a little like corporations. You know, corporations want to appear like they um, <clears throat> like they're impenetrable fortresses. What can you do? Go fight City Hall. Well, it turns out a corporation is incredibly delicate and we watch them blink out in a heartbeat. It happened during COVID all the time. You know, I mean, how many days of zero burgers sold would it take for McDonald's to just die permanently? Not even a week. Corporations are very delicate and, and so are fascists. It's always a minority. It's never the majority. I, I liken fascism to the blowfish. They always want to appear bigger than they are. Remember Trump uh, going, going nuts over the size of the inauguration crowd, you know, with the lies, you know, the size, the size, the size. They always want to appear bigger than they are. Even, uh, even in Germany, the, it was, the fascist party was not the majority. They were plurality. They were less than 50%, significantly less than 50%. They wanted to appear bigger. So they look for, um, and the same thing happens today, they look for the Reichstag moment. Whether they planned it or whether the Reichstag happens, you know, the fires in the, in the, in the government building, um, whether it was planned or whether it was opportunistic, it doesn't matter because Hitler declared martial law. So then he had some iron fist at the beginning you know, of all the control, um, whether or not they're the majority. I mean, MAGA is a huge minority, but it's highly coordinated. And if they can get some middle people gaslit enough, afraid enough, you know, and trans people are the scapegoat to du jour, you know, but, you know, watch, watch who's next. So I think, you know, countering that, you know, to let allies know how delicate they are, you know, this, they're much more fragile than, than, than they would appear. They just have guns, just that. <laughs> but, you know, people, people with their guns, you know, it's, it's almost a confession of how powerless they are. Well, that's a good example too. The NRA only has four million people. They're not that big. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they're on the roads too. You know, they're having trouble. And you know, it's just helpful to know this. You know, I mean, if they like boxing, have them watch Ali Frazier. Rather, Ali Foreman. You know, nobody thought he could win. Ali knew better. You know, so and and. You know what Ali did in that fight, the rope a dope. He's incredibly patient. And likewise, you know, if you're patient enough and you're skillful enough, you know, and if you point out to just the right person, can you please take out your cell phone and Google live sex? How come Moms for Liberty doesn't talk ever about that? It's plain as day. In the right moment, if you're patient, things can tumble. It's so obvious, you know, and fascism relies on the Fifth Avenue moment. You know, like a fascist, if a fascist is a chess player, they, they'd only move their rooks. Move with the rooks are obvious. 
Everybody knows you're moving your rope. There's nothing tricky. They're not on diagonals. They're not jumping pieces. It's the Fifth Avenue move. We're just gonna we're just gonna mow you down publicly. You can't do a thing about it. You know, it's very very obvious. But what happens is. If you go along a certain amount of time not pointing out the obvious, that's where we get in trouble. We have a media that's afraid to use the word fascism. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. I mean, I, I published a piece with the LA Times. Um, and, and at one point, I counted the number of words a New York Times editorial spent avoiding the word fascism. It was like 22 words. Where you could just put the word fascism because it's what this is. And historians are, are arguing Talmudically over, well, is it fascism? It's fascism. It's American fascism. It's got everything. It walks like a duck, it talks like a duck. And they love us not naming it. And you got Marjorie Taylor Green calling Democrats fascists. <laughs> they want to own the word. You know, um, so my sense is it's fascism. You know, and and I think allies, if they knew that, if they knew their power, they, they, they'd get interested. People like power. The other thing I'd say in terms of strategy is, I know this as a writer, I look for the things that only I can write. You know, otherwise nobody needs to hear from me, frankly. I'm bored by myself, and that's healthy for a writer. But if I have a front row seat on a group of people that's fading out of history, it's up to me. Let's do it. Let's go. You know that Bob Dylan line? I guess it must be up to me. And, um, you know, no one's ever, to my satisfaction, described the phenomenology, the lived texture of reality of a trans kid in 1968 who's fully trans and doesn't know it and is five years old. I'm going to do that because I've never read it before. I've always read this overlay of modern terminology. That's not the reality. Reality is a displacement from reality. Well, let's write it, let's see if we can do it. So likewise, if there's something that I can uniquely do, that I'm positioned to do, small or large, defend an institution, and I think everyone might have that version. You just look around yourself. You are positioned in a university, you know this, you know, and, and you've got this privilege and this place, um, you know, to, to turn some dials that, that you've got your hands on. No one else does. I, I, think, I think that could be the case for any ally. You know, look for what only you can do, no matter how small it is. That's my pep talk. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to close with a poem? Yes. It's always good to have a poem to close. Um, how, about, uh, how about I read you a recent poem called Karen? Would you like to hear a poem called Karen? <laughs> um, let me, uh, I, I think. Uh, um, well, this is a word we know. It's become this technical term. So this is how I look like in a poem. Take off my prose trousers, put on my poetry dress. This is, this is what a poem for me might look like. Karen. I have always been fond of the name Karen on account of my first girlfriend. Platinum blonde, taller than me, flat chested, a great dancer whose hands, when she held them out, trembled. Though her voice never did, a steady alto free of affect, like a tomboy. Though she wasn't, she was just honest, never snide nor snobby. In fact, I've never met a snobby Karen. Her name, you could say, aged like fine wine. Unlike Wayne, a name more like vinegar, beginning with Wayne on Scudder Place, who was full of shit. The Kevins, of my life often be freckled, have all been decent, though you can keep the steeps. And holy shit, don't get me started on the Natalies. Catherine's always took some getting used to, 
Regina's were worth the trouble, and every Jane was a straight shooter. <clears throat> God knows I tried to avoid the Heathers, didn't we all? But coming back to Karen, I cannot say why the first one set the template any more than I can say why people resemble their dogs. The Henrys, too, and the Helens totally rocked, which is more than I could say for the Randys. I don't mean to be prejudiced, but you'd better keep an eye on that Randy. Though never carrot, a name as clean and crisp as a bite into a carrot, <clears throat> which is why I'm so confused by these Karens we keep hearing about doing stuff my Karens would never do. Don't be so sure, says Hakim, whose name on a resume spells his demise. Oh, her again, says Tamika, and spits as Luther and Alfonso look down and shake their heads. And I have to admit, <clears throat> Karen has become a problem, which has spread to Susan and even to Becky with the good hair. It's just so hard to believe that my Karen with the shaky hands could be a Karen dropping a dime or demanding to see the manager. And again, I haven't seen her in decades. I heard she got married to a doctor on the east side and became a mom. I only knew a girl who was kind to everyone in our all white town and now no one will give her name to a child. Lately, I feel lucky to be a Diana, a royal name steeped in supremacy due to Diana Ross and the Supremes. Yet still, I ought to behave. We all should. And I guess that's the point. Whoever you are, I hate yourself. Thank you.